In terms of this, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the laws and regulations affecting Canadians when doing business internationally. So this is when you buy something from Amazon or uh, sign a contract with someone on eBay to to sell you a, a part for an old 1952 Chevy or something along those lines. And uh, we're going to look at that primarily as the focus. And then we're going to look at uh, international trading relationships, which is really uh, the, the fact that several governments, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, for example, have the North American Free Trade Agreement and what implications they have for doing business. And finally, uh, there's a last section, which is kind of a um, examine emerging trends in Canadian business law. That's kind of a catch all. What we're going to be looking at there is um, um, the copyright patent legislation. So that, that'll be next week. We'll look at that. So this, this unit is kind of a hodgepodge, but it really is looking at uh, a lot of online type operations. That's, that's primarily what we're focused on. So what I've called this is part one, and uh, part one is really international law and internet transactions. So the internet really facilitates business, education, entertainment, and social interaction. And if you look at the internet, the internet is different. Now you folks are generally used to this now, as I am as well. We don't think of it anymore. But when the internet, when I sat in room uh, 201, which is normally our classroom. When I sat there in 1994, and um, someone introduced me to this newfangled computer system called the internet, it was it was more apparent then than it is now, because it was so neat to be able to press a button and to be able to access something from somewhere else in the world or to be able to send an email for, to anyone anywhere in the world. And it was novel back then, but now we think nothing of it. Realistically, political borders mean nothing on the internet. You can access any site from anywhere, provided that it's not blocked, but you can access any site from any in the, anywhere in the world just as easy as you can access a site next door. So. Distance is no longer relevant. But, you know, if we think about it, one of the early problems that came up with the Internet was because of this very same virtue, the fact that you can access stuff from anywhere in the world, that also posed to be a bit of a vice. Because if you are buying something based on uh, seeing it on the Internet, you would form a contract. Now, how would you form a valid contract? You know, we've got offer acceptance. Yeah, you can see doing that. Um, consideration. Okay, so in order to bring consideration into it, what you got to have is an exchange of something of value in order to bring, bring uh, that forth. Now, normally when we think about it, you go into Walmart and you put it on the counter and you buy the item and you walk out the store with it. Now, that exchange was pretty easy to see, right? You handed over your credit card or handed over your money, and you got the product, and you walked out the door. On the Internet, though, you don't see anyone, number one. You don't see the product, number two. And number three, this real exchange happens. Well, it doesn't happen very well at all, frankly, in the, in the very early stages, because from a legal point of view, I mean, it doesn't happen very well. Um, let's say, for example, you wanted to buy this part, and it's going to cost you, let's say, $100. Okay, so how do you physically transfer the money and transfer the part at the same time? You know, someone's going to require a good bit of trust. I'm going to send you $100. You're in Tahiti. I send you $100 via... Uh, I don't know, I write a check for you and I put it in an envelope. Now, this is, you know, back in the early days of the Internet. Okay, let, let's think about it from that perspective. I put a check in the mail. I send it you in Tahiti. So you're going to cash that check. Will you ever send me that part? What are my, what are my, you know, what, what legal 
proceedings would I have to go if if you cash check, take the money and never send me the part? So this created a huge problem for the internet and it really gave it a bit of a black eye back in the late 90s because one of the, the potentials that was realized very early was the power for e-commerce, that is to be able to do business online and to buy and sell products online. And well, you know, this is very much a legal process because we need to be able to establish a contract and the contract has to be enforceable. And how can you enforce something across international borders was one problem. And how do you provide, probably the larger problem is how do you provide security to people buying or to people selling that they're either going to get paid or get the product that they want. So a lot of very smart people started thinking about this. And over the course of the last 30 years of the experience of the internet, we have seen many resolutions to this come up. Uh, one of the most earliest sites that really came about was eBay. And what eBay did is they more or less provided a buy and sell platform for items that were sold. And, you know, you, you're probably familiar with eBay now because you probably used it at some point in time. But as you're well aware, if you've used eBay, that you can buy virtually anything. And it comes from virtually anywhere. And if you're willing to pay the price in the postage on it, they can get it. Now, the thing is what eBay does is it allows you to buy the product and transfer money and have a reasonable degree of security that A, your money is going to go to the right place and B, you'll get the product for that money because what eBay does is guarantee the sale. Okay, so they've taken away the, the risk of it. Another very popular site that has made people like Elon Musk, who the people behind Tesla and SpaceX and these sorts of things, well, Elon was one of the people that came up with this concept of PayPal. And what PayPal does is it effectively is a third party. So what that third party does is the third party accesses your credit card. So you go to the third party, PayPal, for example, and you connect your credit card to PayPal. So when you go to buy something on eBay, you can pay with PayPal. So if you've got a PayPal account, what PayPal will do will send the money to the company that you want to send it to. They will do that. They will electronically transfer the funds, but they will do it, not you. Your, what they will do to you is charge your credit card for it. So what that does is it provides a barrier between you and the company so that you can't get ripped off or you're not giving them your credit card information. So it provides a degree of security. So PayPal has really taken off in terms of securing transactions for people. Internet service providers, which are ISPs, um, internet service providers too have really stepped up by um, creating more accountability on the internet. So for example, if someone is selling on the internet, the ISP, which is their address, like a postal address, will be identified and hopefully through the recognition of who sold you it, they could try to redress any problems that may occur. So yeah, all those things are wonderful, but still from a legal point of view, the lawyers are gonna ask, do we have a contract here? How can it be enforceable? What powers do we have to make things right if things go wrong? So normal civil and criminal laws and regulations apply to online transactions and activities within Canada, really, you know, if, if we're thinking about dealing with some guy in Ontario or some guy in British Columbia, you can pretty well rest assured that the Canadian legal system will be there to help you if you ran into problems. Okay. So that, you know, normal civil and criminal things would come up. So if, and what do we mean by criminal? You're thinking, well, what are some of the criminal issues? Well, we've seen criminal issues emerge from online sales when they sell like illegal weapons. Okay. If illegal weapons get sold online or those sorts of things or drugs. Uh, but there is the problem really is magnified 
when you're going across jurisdictions. What we mean by jurisdictions is really international jurisdictions, okay? So how do we, for example, determine where the product came from, first of all? Because on the internet, everything is, the, the country of origin, unless they sell, tell you what it is, it really doesn't matter to you. You're looking for that part for that 52 Chevy, and you don't care if it's coming from Hong Kong, South Africa, United States, or Grand Falls. Really, you know, it, it doesn't matter. So determining the appropriate jurisdiction has been a problem from a legal point of view. Where is this coming from? Where is the law being broken to? So that's one thing. But the other thing is really enforcement. Who's going to go knock on the door of the guy that took your $100 and cashed the check and walked away? Who's going to go knock on the door and say, could we get that money back, please? Because you, it's not rightfully yours. So enforcement is really, really a challenge. So over the course of the last 30 years, in order to you know, one of the things the internet is built on is trust and like money itself. It has to be built on trust. And business and governments recognize that if the trend is towards more e-commerce activities, governments are going to have to put things in place to ensure that, first of all, jurisdictional issues are no longer a problem. Okay, so that the laws must be applicable in the various countries in order to make this work well. So Canada, for example, has adopted, the United States has adopted, most of the, I'm going to say most of the first world have adopted legal policies that relate to online contracts. Secondly, enforcement. And again, the legal system as well as the, the judicial system and the legislative system that make the rules, the government, have created a whole bunch of new policies to try to catch up with some of the advancements that we have seen on online sales. <clears throat> so, you know, they, they looked at the laws that were already in place. And if we think about, we've talked about this issue of a contract and the essential elements of a contract. Well, how do we apply that same law to the internet? You know, this idea, as I mentioned, about consensus. How do we, how do we give something in exchange in order to bring about this consideration issue? How, how do we do that? You know, and the law as it stands is not geared up for, it didn't envisage, was not geared up for an internet-based system. So government's been wrong reluctant to introduce regulation control, but that's now changing. Why were they reluctant? Well, they were reluctant because they just didn't understand. The, the amount of understanding, and that holds true uh, largely everywhere, is, you know, the legal system is a very staid, old-fashioned type system that's built on precedent. So when you get this newfangled system that no one has really contemplated before, laws don't necessarily work. They're different from one country to another. And for the courts to handle it, you know, the courts got to really start fresh. And if they don't understand the basic concepts, then, you know, it really runs into some uh, problems and you're going to get some pushback from the point of view of the legal community. So as I say, you know, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems is this idea of determining the jurisdiction and the internet really doesn't recognize borders. It's hard to determine which laws apply and we must determine, you know, we must determine where the action is brought really in order to bring an action. So where is this 52 Chevy right fender coming from? If you can't tell, you can't very well launch a lawsuit because again, you don't know where the country was. And more importantly, you know, we got all kinds of regulations out there that relate to movement of products with regards to human rights, with regards to freedom of expression. And there's all kinds of rules with regards to freedom of association. Now, if we look at Canada, you know, we look, we, all we gotta do is look to the Charter of Rights and Freedom and say, here are the basic rights. And you'll notice all of those are in there. That's true. But, you also have limits on freedom of expression in Canada. I cannot today go out and write something that is patently 
um, bigoted. Okay, I cannot do something that that is designed really to generate hate in a given society because. Again, the Canadian legal system is based on the principle that your rights begin where mine end. And my freedom of expression is limited by your freedom to not hear that expression. In the United States, however, the freedom of expression is much more greatly focused on the individual. So we've talked about the First Amendment and these sorts of things, but the fact of the matter is in the United States, is that freedom of expression is is held to be sacrosanct and no matter what you're saying whether it's offensive or whether it's blatantly untrue or whether it creates you know whether it could create um, the argument is it could create uh, issues related to um, uh, bigotry and the like in the united states you have the right to say those things and the question is, you know, what can you do? We've had some issues with regards to this in Canada in terms of uh, in terms of online selling with uh, sex toys. And um, there was an issue there. It was a case uh, last year or the year before where someone had a blow-up doll come into Canada. And the blow-up doll was more of a child than anything else. And this person was charge under the uh, appropriate law in Canada, and I forget exactly what the appropriate law would be, but it has to do with uh, morality. And it was argued that this was uh, child pornography, okay? And there are limits to with regards to that. And it ended up in, in court, and it probably is going to end up in Supreme Court, you know, how what, what right does government have? How far do those rights stretch? These sorts of things for online transactions. Government is also very interested in online tax, uh, online transactions because of taxation. You know, when we buy things online, we're supposed to pay the tax on it. If you notice when you go into eBay or if you notice if you go into any of the what I call reputable online sites, there's no taxation. Now, if you were to go buy something on Newfoundland Classifieds, Notice that Newfoundland classifieds when you go meet Buddy in the mall parking lot to buy that Skidoo helmet that you bought for $52 because you got a deal on, on Newfoundland classifieds, there's no tax involved, is there? Well, you know, the government doesn't like that. And when we're talking about international transaction, you could be thinking about billions of dollars lost, billions of taxation dollars lost. So government certainly wants to be able to get a handle on online transactions from a point of view of taxation. <clears throat> Um, so this issue of jurisdiction is really, really, really tangly. And generally, a particular location can exercise jurisdiction if the defendant is resident there or if action underlying the complaint took place there. That sounds good and wonderful. But the question that you have to ask yourself is prove it. How do you know that someone actually lives there? How do you know that that person is there on the Internet? You know, you can create fake um, accounts. You can say that you're in Canada, but you're actually in Hong Kong, you know. So it's very hard to prove that. So if you know the jurisdiction of where the product came from, yeah, you could probably go after that jurisdiction. You know, if you ordered that vendor from somewhere in Tahiti, you sent the money, you never got the product, you'd go after the, the Tahiti, the, the government there in Tahiti, and you say, look, this came from your jurisdiction. I want you to go and uh, and arrest or whatever summons this guy that that took my money and didn't send me the thing. That's great. Just prove that it was in Tahiti. Uh, long arm statutes may allow jurisdictions even when non-residents are involved. So these are statutes that allow us to to um, identify where the item came from and then apply the laws in that area. But this is all gangly, tangly, and very difficult. So one of the things that mm, more modern governments, progressive governments, uh, first world governments have done is recognizing the importance of online transactions, particularly in the business-to-business -business world, okay? 
the, the laws have changed over the last number of years to allow jurisdiction to uh, only where there's a close connection where the jurisdiction act is complained of and uh, it may help to state the contract where the jurisdiction governs the transaction. So <clears throat> in certain uh, certain jurisdictions, for example, you have to be very clear where it's coming from. And if the laws are set up, uh, if, for example, Canada has an agreement with XYZ country, uh, then there is a process in place to seek uh, remediation if there is a problem. The online offer or service should state limitations of availability. So again, you know, it's just that covering your proverbial rear end. In uh, laws have changed, as I say, over the last number of years. And the question is, okay, if I'm buying this from here, what laws, what laws are going to protect me here in Newfoundland, or what laws are going to protect me in Canada? The Newfoundland Consumer Protection Act. Here is the um, let me go up to the top of it, the Consumer Protection and Business Practices Act for Newfoundland and Labrador. And you can see with the amendments, it was an act of 2009. And you can see it's been updated. So this is a fairly recent update. And if you can imagine that um, this, this act encompasses online selling. Okay. So you can think of the traditional... Uh, the traditional issues related to uh, consumer practices, for example, unfair practices, unfair consumer practices, unconscionable acts, such as unconscionable transactions, you know, I charge a million percent or something, that would make it unconscionable, that's what we mean, or that are not in the best interest. Unsolicited goods, someone sends you something in the mail and then sends you a check, a bill for it. Credit cards. Consumer contracts for direct sales contracts. But look, Division 2 talks about distant sales contracts. So what do we do if we got a distant sale? So in Division and Division 3, distant sales contract means a contract for supply of goods and services between supplier and consumer <coughs> that is not entered into in person and with respect to the goods for which the consumer does not have the opportunity to inspect the goods that are the subject of contract before the contract is entered into, but it does not include prepaid purchase card. So, you know, what we got here is a set of rules that relate to this. Now, again, getting this to apply in a foreign jurisdiction may not work. But if it is in Canada, so if you're buying this item in Vancouver or if you're buying this in Ottawa, these rules would be applied because if you look at Ontario's consumer protection legislation, this is Newfoundland's, but if you look at Ontario's almost identical issue, almost identical consumer protection legislation now exists across the jurisdictions of Canada. So online selling within the boundaries of Canada is reasonably protected. You know, we've got um, we've got these uh these particular sets of laws with regards to distant selling contract, the supplier shall disclose the following information to the consumer before the consumer enters into the distant sales contract. So there's a bunch of things there. Um, okay, so mail address, detailed description, currency in which the amount, suppliers, delivery agreements, including the identity of the shipper, suppliers, cancellation, return, exchange policies. Okay. Um, in this section, electronic means Electronic Commerce Act before the consumer enters into distance contracts. That is an electronic form of supplier shall make the information required under Section 29 available in a manner that requires the consumer to access the information, allows the consumer to retain and print the information, correct errors, and that sort of thing. You know, this is all geared up for the Internet. Now, I'm not going to ask you, by the way, I'm not dealing into the detail of this. I just want you to understand it exists. Okay? So... Don't worry about the detail. For the purposes of this course, that's beyond the scope. Okay. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, a supplier shall give the consumer or interest in the distant sales contract a copy of the contract within 15 days. 
consumer may cancel distant contract by giving notice. So all of these things, uh, return of consumer on cancellation. So all of these things are geared up there in this law. And, you know, they've got disclosure, of, you know, they've got a fairly good detail in terms of law now on how the contract is formed up. Yeah, a distance service contract shall be written in plain language, provided in paper form. The requirement to provide contract in paper from under paragraph is not satisfied by the provision of electronic information authorized by the Electronic Commerce Act. A distance service contract shall be completed in duplicate. Consumer signature shall appear. A renewal, amendment. So all of these things are specifically set up for online transactions, okay? So over the last number of years, the law has, it never really catches up, but it's come a long ways with regards to facilitating uh, contracts over the internet. But, you know, that works great within Canada, but as I say, pure foreign jurisdictions, ah, you can't guarantee that the same rules are gonna exist in the foreign jurisdiction. So they're very hard to enforce. And we need to, you know, we need to make sure that we got that. So what has the internet and what have other governments done? Well, first of all, the name, domain names. Uh, domain names is the www.whatever.com, okay? Um, they're a unique address. You know every company has a unique domain name. But the thing is, who manages that? Well, Uniform Domain Name Disputes Resolution Act or policy, the international uh, agency responsible for the internet has created sets of rules and uh, processes in place to arbitrate uh, domain names. We've had a lot of problems. One of the very first things that happened on the internet was um, in the early, I'm going to call it the early days, when people recognized that, yeah, you know, this, uh, this concept has some potential. A lot of people went and they bought up domain names, like Canadian Tower, for example. Okay, Canadian Tower was not the fastest on the mark with regards to getting an internet account or getting set up on the internet. And when they did, they went to get their name and they realized that, hey, somebody's already got it. And it they had to do some legal wrangling, but eventually they did get to CanadianTower.com. But this... This process um, does ensure that companies who are legitimate can get it. McDonald's, I think, had the same problem. Um, and then we got other issues with regards to it. Uh, what we're finding more like these days is spoofing companies will get names very similar. So McDonald's, instead of McDonald's, it will be just spelt M-D-O-N. Or, you know, it's just spelt slightly, a slight variation on the name to, in order to cause people to be confused and to cause people to think and to, to spoof a site. Or in the case of some sites, it's just people that make fun of sites. Crappy Tar, uh, you know, we know that Canadian Tar's unofficial uh, uh, nickname is Crappy Tar. Well, in fact, Canadian Tar went and bought the rights to crappytar.com so that nobody could get it. So... This is called cyber squatting. So what they've done is they've gone out and they bought all these names up so that nobody can get it and do something to them. So uh, there is a dispute mechanism um, and bodies responsible for registration of domain names. So the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, I've made these clickable, I don't need to go to them though, sets policy for arbitration. For Canadian domain names, bodies like British Columbia International Commercial Arbitration Center and Resolution Canada Incorporated offer arbitration services. And the World Intellectual Property Organization is the largest arbitration service in the world. So you can see that there are entities in place that arbitrate these um, internet disputes. Now, you can like we've seen, torts can take place on the internet too. Defamation is the most common internet tort. So I write something online that's not too nice about someone, right? So widespread distribution and uncertain jurisdiction make internet cases unique. So we've had problems in Canada, for example. There was a particularly um, newsworthy or noteworthy case in Canada about 
this guy who was a Holocaust a denier. And he wrote considerable amount on this, and the Canadian Jewish Congress um, went to try to stop it. The thing is that he set it up outside of Canada. So we had this issue of where is the hate speech coming from, and do we have jurisdiction over it? Um, person or employer may be liable for the torts, no different than in reality. Internet service provider may be liable if it fails to remove or block offending messages when required by the court. So the internet service provider, Bell or one of these companies, are responsible when a complaint comes in place to block certain things. So for example, in the case of the Holocaust deniers, they had to block these various sites. And then you run into problems, okay, if you're blocking that, someone's gonna argue, well, that's a, that's a freedom of speech issue. Uh, legal status of internet transactions is really determined by contract law, we've seen that, and written copies of online transactions can be altered, particularly a problem with the statute of fraud. So, you know, I can get into my Word document, change the, how can we, if we're going to write a document, how can I make sure that I don't change it or you don't change it? Uh, so, this, this issue has been addressed uh, in statute, the provinces enacted statutes based on the Federal Form Uniform Electronic Commerce Act guidelines to recognize electronic documents as signatures for electronic documents. They these electronic signatures, and I don't know if how if you've run across these, but there is such a beast out there as now an electronic signature. I had to do one not too long ago for investments, and uh, so you basically what you do is it's I accept by clicking on this I recognize that or I grant so effectively is a click you click through things you answer these questions and it says at the very bottom I recognize that this binds me to the contract or something along that lines effectively so this is what's called the uh, the idea of a written uh, approval online and the problem is though you know there are slight differences amongst provinces and it doesn't apply to all documents um, the business may state the law of a specific jurisdiction will apply in a transaction. That means, you know, there's a Newfoundland company, so we're dealing with the Newfoundland jurisdiction or whatever. Clicking I accept creates consensus. As I say, the type of document is, it got a lot of information there, and at the very bottom it says, by clicking this, you accept the conditions of the contract. Click. And once you click it, it is accepted. Offer accepted in contract form when their offer learns of the acceptance. So when send is hit. This goes back to the, the post, doc, post box rule. Message received when it arrives on the recipient's computer, even if it hasn't been read. <coughs> the capacity issue is a problem. No question about it. It's difficult to know if the other party has the capacity to enter into a contract. You know, click this if you're over 18. Really, who is going to check? It's very difficult to check. So the parties may need more information than simply what appears on the website. And federal government has come up with some guidelines for development and implementation of use of authentication products and services in Canada. But again, that still remains one of the things. And one way of one way of authentication is a social insurance number. But you know, who's to say that? Well, first of all. Should your social insurance number be used for this? A lot of people will say no, unless you're dealing with the federal government. And the other thing is I can put in a false uh, social insurance number because the social insurance number is coded with information with regard to my age. And, you know, this issue of legality online is a problem too. Uh, legal activities are widespread on the internet. Wow, you know, surprise, surprise. Sale of Goods Act and consumer protection legislation theoretically apply, but fraudulent Fraudulent scams are common. Look on Facebook. Ten minutes through Facebook will certain, certainly point you towards some of these fraudulent scams. Uh, some avoid rules for specific ju jurisdictions by, by moving their business. We see that. Businesses hop around. And really, if it's no more than plugging your computer into the wall or hooking it up online uh, via modem, I mean, it's very easy to move jurisdictions. And unfortunately, the victims of these scams have little recourse, especially if it's in another country.
So online payment is uh, you know a problem. As I say, PayPal uh, is really geared to help consumers get what was paid for and provide remedies for disputes. So um, PayPal is really the one that has been most popular in this. Uh, the idea of what's legal differs from one jurisdiction to another. And you got to convince the court that it has the jurisdiction over the event. Uh, so the best thing in a contract when you're ready to contract is to say, what is the jurisdiction we're dealing with? And this is who is dealing with. So the contract should say sales in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, you know, legislation is still trying to keep up with the internet. I don't know if we'll ever catch it, but anti-spam legislation is, a bit of, uh, is something that's on the books. It still hasn't been put in place. Um, government is most interested in taxes. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of the problem in taxes is Airbnb. Okay, Airbnb, when you go buy uh, Airbnb, which is a platform for a platform for uh, booking um, accommodations, someone's house somewhere, uh, collecting the taxes for that sort of thing. Government has had very little success with regulations and, and taxes in any of those sites. It's one of those ongoing things. And I will tell you from experience that government has little appetite to deal with it because they're trying to find the solution to the problem and they don't want some patchwork solution. So basically government's hiding their head in the sand right now with regards to a lot of these problems until they come up with a big fix. Uh, and, and fundamentally, you know, when you're out on the international business world, there is no such thing as an international court to legislate or to litigate private matters. There's no such thing. So as a result, you're kind of out there in the in the ether. And uh, you know, internet dispute resolution mechanisms only really address disputes between sovereign nations. So for example, Canada versus Britain or Canada versus the United States, not you versus Joe down in Tahiti. Um, and if we think about international business, you know, there's a huge volume of international business going on, import, export is is big you know billions trillions of dollars worth of product gets sold every year one of the biggest problems is intellectual property how do we secure intellectual property and what we mean by international intellectual property is stuff that is the creation of someone's mind okay music songs this issue with intellectual property with regards to music has been a long-standing one with the internet. Um, the original opportunities that were used were give signs away for free. The artists didn't like that, and uh, they were shut down. Uh, Spotify is out there now, and Spotify is probably the largest one in terms of music, and effectively you can download or play any song you'd ever want. So why would you ever buy another album? But how much do the artists get paid? Pennies. So uh, the artists are really upset with uh, some of the issues with regards to streaming other signs. It's great to be able to get it out, but they're not getting any, any feedback for it. COVID has exacerbated the problems because they haven't been able to get out and do concerts. So um, you know, artists are really suffering and they're kicking off a lot of fuss, justifiably, with regards to their intellectual property. Um, there is a story going on right now if you watch the news, uh, you'll see that there is a new uh, type of product, investment product out, that allows you to buy the rights to an original work of art. And whatever it is, the coding, the electronic coding goes on to the original. So if I take a picture and put it up, there's nothing to prevent you, me, anyone else from sending that, putting it on Facebook, doing anything with it to spread it around the world. So the question is, who owns the original? Who, how do you maintain ownership of the original? And this new piece of software, new piece of technology allows this to happen. And apparently people are making millions on it because they're buying and selling art on this. So there's a lot of this art that is being sold right now. 
Um, we got issues with regards to property uh, and 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 all the items that are involved on the internet uh, create some huge problems internationally. We can't, you know, we can't guarantee that contracts are well written. We can't guarantee that government regulations are going to be there to protect us. We can't guarantee that money can be easily transferred. So there's a lot of push on in the world now to to make these more secure and more uh, bolstered uh, to ensure that people don't run into problems. So the basic rules are know who you're contracting with, acquire the services of a professional, recognize certain terms of contract may be invalid in certain jurisdictions. Contracts should specify all the obligations and expectations, any related assumptions, a potential dispute mechanism in the event that something goes wrong, uh, the particular jurisdiction in which the laws apply, uh, any financial reporting requirements, um, you know, uh, and we've got this issue of foreign ownership too, and how much is a company local, how much is it foreign? So these these things come into play. We've also got uh, the issue with regards to litigation. As I say, you know, there's no real guarantees that the court's going to help you because in a different jurisdiction. Where there's no rules, the court might find nothing to really uphold. Different sets of rules in different jurisdictions might not uphold anything. So um, you got to be able to, to be very, tread very carefully with regards to jurisdictions. And, you know, we see some jurisdictions, more progressive ones, are applying uh, territorial competence tests to determine the court jurisdiction. So we, we've got to figure out where is this coming from and if there are treaties or these sorts of things between the various courts uh get down to that somewhere down here yeah some conventions provide for reciprocating enforcement so can the united states and mexico for example in their free trade agreement have these conventions in place okay if uh if you run into problems then the other countries' laws will take care of it. So it's like a guarantee. And this helps facilitate trade. If no reciprocating enforcement agreement is in place, the person wanting to enforce under must sue on a judgment in the other jurisdiction. So well, effectively, you got to sue in a court in that third country, in that other country. And the process can be long, complicated, expensive, and never work. Um, a classic example of this litigation problem is uh, IMP Group. Uh, they're based in Halifax. You drive past Halifax Airport. Uh, they're in uh, on your way down to Halifax. You'll see IMP. IMP is a fairly large company. They own planes. They do work on planes. But they're also in the hotel business. And they had a hotel in. Uh, they had the Minsk Hotel in Moscow. Uh, they own a 51% share of the hotel with um, the Moscow city government were the other holders. I think theirs were 51, Moscow was 49. Anyway, uh, this particular morning they come in and uh, the the people who work at the hotel, the I'm going to call it the Canadians who worked at the hotel, were asked to leave. Uh, they were no longer welcome here. The government, basically the Russian government, had basically taken over the hotel and said, IMP, go home. So IMP's share of the hotel was really irrelevant at that stage they were told to go home and imp has been fighting this for the last 10 years and the chances of getting a resolution on it are doesn't look very good so um you know we we, we can see there are some defenses main defenses may be raised to prevent enforcement of foreign jurisdictions for example problem with process different laws you know Getting enforcement in a third country is just really crazy. So you got to rely on Canada to have international treaties with these, and these encourage free trade by reducing and limiting trade and trade barriers, and, and certainly putting laws and, and regulations in place with regards to business transaction. Um, the general agreement on tariffs and trades, which is a world type agreement between large countries, is to promote fair trade and it reduces trade barriers, and it tries to come up with a reasonable set of trade rules. Uh, GET uh, is helpful, but it's not totally helpful for legal transactions. 